So what is the Foundry? Foundry is an application I'm working on for uh, runners, cyclists, and swimmers. Uh, obviously, swimmers only use the Apple Watch, but everybody else will be using the iPhone as well. It's basically a training computer which collects the data from the workouts and gives possibility for the athletes to analyze their data, improve their performance from the data, and so and basically make them perform better from the data they collect. Uh, and let me tell you, triathletes and those athletes love collecting data. And this market is like really booming right now because of the technology. And uh, you will find many, many, many devices which help you do that. Um, so what data are we talking about? So we start really, really old ones which were very popular from like 2000. This is heart rate, obviously. Uh, speed and cadence, so how fast you are moving and how basic how fast you're spinning the wheel, uh, spinning your legs on the cycling when cycling or uh, when you are running. Uh, lately, uh, there is also a methodology to collect power, how much power you actually input into your bicycle to move forward. Uh, and there are some other things like environmental sensing, like uh, what is the temperature outside, what's the humidity, because it affects your performance as well. Uh, and like for a couple of years now, there are popular metrics like running dynamics, how much, for example, how much time you spend uh, in air when you're running, because basically that's wasted energy, you want to go forward rather than go up and down. So improving that will make you faster. And I have a funny title there, cycling dynamics, not dynamics, <laughs> which is like power balance, so whether your right leg is more strong or left leg is weak. You basically want them to be even, not like dominant one or the other. So how do athletes collect this data? So as I mentioned, there's, sense that there's a huge business of making sensors which provide the data. So obviously this, those sensors go on your body, sometimes on the bicycle, but mostly on your body. So the goal is for those sensors has to be as light as possible uh, and to be wireless. And that's the key word. Uh, also, they have to have a really, really good battery life. Uh, for example, one of the most popular and challenging uh, sport, like triathlon event, is an Ironman, which is like three. For almost four kilometers of swimming, 180 kilometers of cycling, and 42 kilometers of running, one after the other. So, like professional athletes take uh, athletes take it like six or seven hours to complete this event, and amateurs like me, for example, hopefully someday, will take from 12 to 17 hours. So, and at all these periods, the sensors should work, and they should provide the data to you on the watch phone or whatever. So you know you are not basically working too hard and you will get to the finish. Uh, there are two popular protocols that work on these sensors. One of them is Garmin developed, Garmin is a company which makes many of those devices. Is Garmin developed N plus. And second is a Bluetooth low energy, which is the main topic of our talk now. Uh, both of them do everything about Actually, they do a battery uh, power much, much better than anything else. Uh, Bluetooth low energy specifications said that a uh, sensor like this, which is like a heart rate sensor, should last at least one year on a single uh, battery cell, which is time. So let's talk Bluetooth. There are a few kinds of Bluetooth technologies. Uh, one of them is Bluetooth Classic, which is really old, and it's almost everywhere, and we hear it all, all the time. And the other one is the Bluetooth Low Energy we're talking today, which is the one with the very, very high constraints on the battery in the design. So they technically are very different things, but they share hardware. That's, and I'm guessing that's why they have the same, almost the same name. But when, you, when we look at from the hardware and software perspective, they are pretty much different. They share like antenna and maybe some chips on the, on the hardware, that's it. 
so Bluetooth low energy, low energy has um, its own software stack, which should be implemented on the both sides, and we'll talk about that. It's called a generic attribute protocol, and for some reason it's GATT. I don't know. I guess generic and attribute. Uh, and there is also a sorry, so software is GATT. Uh, Bluetooth Smart is another name for Bluetooth Low Energy. It's basically the same. It's only a marketing name for the Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, you will not find Bluetooth Smart in technical documentations, but when you are buying devices and or doing like product research, you will always see Bluetooth Smart. But those two things are the same. And the cool thing about Bluetooth Low Energy for us is that it's almost it's always supported on almost every smartphone and like connected device we have right now. So let's talk Bluetooth Low Energy. How it works. So the whole premise of the Bluetooth Low Energy is to connect two devices so they can exchange data, right? Uh, the organization that has the standard calls those two devices uh, client and server. So one has a data and another wants the data, which makes sense. But um, you, we will see the situations when these uh, kind of client-server names are a bit more confusing. So, uh, oh, sorry. So we will use uh, different names, which are used mostly in our like iOS community. Uh, as you can see, there is like arrow pointing into the front server to the client. This is by design of how Bluetooth standard was designed, but that's actually not 100% true. You can do communication both ways, but it was designed to do in one way. So let's come to the world of iOS. Uh, in iOS, the thing that wants data is called a central, and usually that's the device which scans for the devices and decides to connect them to themselves or to disconnect. And the things that get connected to things and that provide data are called peripherals, like this heart rate sensor or any other device. Uh, Bluetooth selling on iOS uh, is managed by Core Bluetooth, which is like a software stack on the iOS, which does all the communication with your hardware antennas and chips and everything, and exposes also an API into your application, which you can use to basically connect to devices or manage data and so on and so forth. It works on almost all Apple products. Uh, it works on iOS, watchOS, tvOS, and I have an asterisk on macOS because it does work on macOS, but I have no experience with it, so I probably cannot, I cannot give like more details on that. As we mentioned, it uses GAT protocol, which is Bluetooth standard defined API of how peripherals should talk to central or each other. So as we said, central is the thing that uh, facilitates based, uh, the, how devices talk to each other and it decides when to scan for devices, it decides which peripherals to connect, and so on and so forth. Peripherals themselves usually are very simple devices. They don't have screen or something. They can have, but that's usually by design. Like, by design they do not, because they meant to be very simple and last for a very, very long time. Uh, number of paired so number of devices you can connect to central is uh, not connect but pair uh, to your device is unlimited and we'll discuss why that why the pair is important and why it's unlimited but number of simultaneously connected peripherals so number of things you can talk in real time at the same time is uh, highly dependent on what device are you using it's not very well documented in Bluetooth standard so you should probably do like a little bit of research if you need to connect to many, many things on what devices you are, what, from what device you are establishing connection and what devices are you connecting from. So it's very, very domain specific. Uh, the asterisk over there means that on the Apple Watch there is deliberate limitation. 
Apple Watch can connect to peripheral, but for some reason, I'm guessing for power reasons, uh, from the API, it's limited to only one simultaneous connection. You can still remember many devices, but when you choose to connect to one, it has to be the one and only one. So, what's the deal with the pairing with the code? Uh, unlike classic Bluetooth, when you do this like pairing thing, like for example in your car or where you, it, it asks you to like uh, copy digits from another device when it, like they remember each other and they automatically connect next time. On Bluetooth LE, that's completely optional, and that's not even a procedure you take in API. You can. There are security protocols which allow you to do so. But again, because the peripherals are such a simple devices, this procedure is basically sometimes just ignored altogether. So, so how, how this happens? Uh, Central, as we said, can always scan for devices, and devices always advertise themselves. They don't hide each other. They, so every time device is present somewhere, it will advertise to everybody. There is no, like, security embedded into them. So the only way it, only time it cannot be seen from central is when it's asleep. So and sometimes usually to wake it up you basically shake it or something like that. Or in this case it's a heart rate sensor, it has a two buttons. You just basically touch your body and close the loop and it will wake up. And now it will if you have a like uh, iPhone or any Bluetooth enabled device you can see. Um, so it is important to understand that you cannot make Bluetooth low energy, such simple Bluetooth low energy devices secure or hide themselves. Uh, and every single, and the important bit which we will talk about after this is that every single Bluetooth device has unique identifier because uh, you have to distinguish one from another, basically, and that's why you choose which one to connect. So if you have like basically two uh, identical devices, they will have unique identifiers, and if they are both awake and you want to connect to one or only one and not another, or the one specific one, not the one which becomes, uh, which wakes up the first one, you have to just know their own unique identifier. Uh, unique identifiers are advertised, so you can just always see which ones you have available to uh, let's talk about software a little bit. So this is how Bluetooth standard defines the protocol of the how software should look on the low energy devices. So if we go like if we read it like a stack from the bottom to the up, there is a thing they call a profile, which basically defines what does your device do or what your device is. Uh, there is a service which is something that groups data. It's, it itself has no data itself, but it contains many data, and the profile can have many services. Uh, and ser all services have characteristics. And characteristics is, is what's basically interesting about Bluetooth Low Energy. It's where the data is stored. It's where we can write, read, or request, or whatever the data. Uh, and there is this small thing called descriptors. They're like characteristics but they are more, they contain data, metadata about the descriptors. It's a bit strange because um, this is how it's defined in the standard, but almost nobody uses descriptors. Everybody writes met uh, metadata into characteristics themselves. So uh, on iOS and every everywhere you will have a opportunity to like talk to descriptors and like request data from them, but in practice you'll find that they're almost useless because that's how industry basically started to use them, or not use them, I guess. So, a little bit more context on iOS. Uh, profiles on iOS become basically your application. So, your application defines the profile, Bluetooth Low Energy Profile. And once you start working with Bluetooth devices, you just forget about it and don't pay attention because that's basically managed by the iOS itself. Uh, service is collection of characteristics because you could have, uh, like, for example, this one, uh, as, this is a bit fancy heart rate monitor. It, 
measures heart rate as well, and also it has an accelerometer. So it can provide like running dyna dynamics data. And because heart rate and running dynamics are really not connected by anything and could be technically on different <coughs> devices, there is no like meaningful connection between them. They are split by services. So services are basically groups of domain. Um, and characteristics are basically value data, values of interesting information we want. Um, to go a bit more detail, uh, this is the classes we'll be working like uh, actually in the code. So th those are exposed to uh, our application. All of them are part of core Bluetooth, so you have to import core Bluetooth. So CB Central Manager is something that defines your profile. So it's can, this is a class that can uh, scan for devices, it can connect to devices, and so on. CB Peripheral is just abstraction of peripheral, so uh, this device on your in your application will be uh, represented as CB Peripheral. Uh, and CB Peripheral will have our services and characteristics also represented by CB Service and CB Characteristics. Before we begin, uh, there is one frustrating thing in iOS. Uh, you have to specify NS Bluetooth peripheral usage descriptor, very much like the location, uh, basic explanation of why do you use Bluetooth, uh, and, and it will. It's also managed by iOS automatically, so you basically allow it on your, your user allows it, and then you have access to the everything else. The frustrating part is that if you forget to do this. Uh, CP Central Manager fails silently, completely silently, and you have no idea what's going on. Uh, another thing, uh, this is optional. If you want your uh, peripherals to be reporting data or just basically working when your application is in background, you check this checkbox in Xcode. Uh, this is only for background views. So let's look at the code. Um, this is very simple uh, scanner class. Uh, it, the only thing it does is scans for devices that are specifically <coughs> heart rate monitors. And how we do this? So uh, we we have to have pass options to the options and delegate to the uh, CB central manager. And there is only one option in CB central manager which is CV Central Manager Options Show Power Alert Key, which is also something that's managed in iOS. And if you instantiate the class and the user has Bluetooth off, uh, it will just pop up the alert which says, hey, your Bluetooth is off. Make sure it's on before you start working with the application. Um, queue is self-explanatory. You can do it on your own queue or main queue. It works. Uh, Although probably it's better to do it in background too. Uh, and then you instantiate the city central manager. Uh, you have to pass delegate in old style in initializer, so it makes it a bit tricky with this way, but it works. Um, so now we are ready to start scanning for devices. And we have an opportunity to scan for either everything or devices with specific uh, services. So here we create just a CB UID. It's just wrapper of UID, which can be anything. And this is basically the data type that CB Central Manager works with. That's it. Uh, UIDs can be anything, strictly typed, but it's commonly reserved types use these quite short versions. And if you make your custom ones, you should make like a 64 bit UID type. Um, Scanning also has an option, also only one option. Uh, CP Central Manager scan option all allow duplicate keys, which means that if it scans for, it does basically scanning in waves, uh, and on each wave it will report everything it finds in the zone. And this key basically tells it, so if you find it, same device in two passes, ignore, ignore it and just show me the unique devices. Do not Every time you see this one device, then it's reporting to me. Um, 
So maybe the services array, which you can you can include many services. You can include as many services as you want, and you'll find all these old devices that have at least one, not all of them, but at least one of those services. And you can start the service. Uh, start start the scanning for the for the paper also. Um, the delegate is pretty important in central manager because it's almost where the, all the work happens. Uh, the <coughs> manager did update state is called every single time something happens to Bluetooth on your device, or so user turns the uh, Bluetooth off, or turns it on, or whatever you it will report it here. And uh, central manager did discover peripheral with advertisement data. This funny thing, which I'll explain already, is, is the place where it will record the results of the scan. And this will be called many, 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 many times uh, until you stop central for scan. So, what's going on here? Uh, central is, for the first time, the central is basically what, that, what comes in delegate. Uh, peripheral is the device it found on this path. And if it found five devices, it will fall like five consecutive times. Uh, advertisement, oops, sorry. advertisement data is uh, data you can obtain about the device without connecting to it. So usually it will have the manufacturer name, serial number, and UID. <coughs> Sometimes a bit more than the like, software version and so on and so forth, but almost always manufacturer name and model, uh, which usually are, not always, but usually are like, user friendly, so you can display them on the, uh, on the user interface. Uh, RSSI is it's actually a computed number from the voltage on the antenna and some other metrics coming from the peripheral. <coughs> Basically, it tells you how strong the connection to the device is, and, and because it's computed, uh, you can reverse compute the distance to it, but it's very approximate, let's just say. Uh, Usually it's not very useful, but you can definitely tell if user is very far or very uh, very far from you, or has a very low battery before you connect to it. Because we will see if you connect to the device, it will give you more data than that. So let's connect to those devices. Uh, everything about the carol is the same. We made a new instance of Central Manager. Uh, and now we have to know what devices we want to connect. Remember when we did the scan? Uh, at that moment we could, uh, for example, our user could select one of them on the user interface and store the, the grab the UID of it. And this is the array which will put those new connected devices. UIDs is the array is the array of UIDs we decided to connect. It can come from, as I said, from user interface. It can come from like persistent store if we connected to those devices like yesterday. Or the cool thing is actually it can come from because it's like very ambiguous. It can come from network. So one device could scan for devices, and second device next day can come and connect to those devices. It's totally doable. Primitive, I should say. So. Central has this method, retrieve peripherals within the identifiers. Basically what it does is, it doesn't do anything with hardware, it's an API call, which creates instances of CV peripherals which are, let's say, empty or disconnected. So it knows that there are some kind of devices with these IDs, but it knows nothing more than that, them, about them. Uh, after that, we just make a loop and connect to all of those devices. Central connect to peripheral uh, basically starts actively using hardware and scanning for devices, and as soon as it finds it, it connects to it automatically. This method is pretty cool because it never expires and uses almost no battery. So you can start it when you start the application and forget about it, and even after like two hours, this sensor comes into the zone of the telephone, it will connect to it. Uh, the Options, I will pass the option, options we have nil here because there is also one, only one option. Uh, you can pass the option where it will, when you request that peripheral will notify you when uh, the, when the state of the peripheral is changed. So if battery dies or something like that. 
like that. But usually that's not a concern, so it's safe to pass me over there. Uh, again, delegate does the most job. Uh, central disconnect peripheral will be called as soon as connection is established. And, oops, and central deep disconnect from peripheral is when the peripheral is switched off or goes out of the zone or basically is no longer uh, connected. It's not, uh, when phone is no longer able to maintain connection to the peripheral. Uh, central deep connect peripheral is probably the most important one because at this point you have to decide what to do with the device. Uh, usually that means you make an abstraction of it in, your, in the way of your application. So I have a my device class here which wraps around my logic, uh, logical, my code which works with the device. So we have to have a reference to the peripheral so we can work with the hardware. Uh, and this is how we initialize it. We can define if whether we know what services work with this device. So in this case, we have a, we only have heart rate. So that's what supported services there is. And we call activate. So here we set delegate on the peripheral, peripheral, and start discovering new services. So this. Basically, we'll start asking, actively asking the device, uh, I know you have this service, tell me more about it. Again, delegate does not job. Uh, the discover services will be called as soon as the services will uh, be discovered uh, on the device. This will be called as many times as many services it has. So, in this case, we have only one. So, we check if there is a service with the guard left. And, and now we want to actually get the measurement of the heart rate measurement for the service. So there is a heart rate measurement CBUID, which is also like standard defined. Uh, we make this UID and ask the peripheral to discover characteristic which is that. And we can pass again as many characteristics as we want to ask. Um, and when this happens, did discover characteristic for service will be called with all the data. So, what are those characteristics? How we work with them? Because we we do we did all this job to get to the actual data which we are interested in, and it's still like a bit cloudy and hazy, right? So, the way characteristics work is that they are also abstraction of some kind of storage on the device, and there are few things we can do with this uh, storage. We can read it, we can write it in two ways, or we can uh, do something which is called set as notify, which essentially means to subscribe to its changes. <coughs> and this is the part which I was referring to uh, when the connection was one way by design, but it's actually working two ways, because writing to the peripheral is totally valid. In. It's a bit more expensive uh, battery-wise, but it works fine. Uh, we can, when we get the characteristic, uh, a reference on the characteristics we are interested, we just can call or read value on the peripheral. And this will, uh, it, it doesn't return value itself, but it will trigger uh, did update value for a characteristic in target. So this way we can just extract data from the uh, characteristic from characteristic of value and print it out or do whatever we want with that. Uh, writing is equally easy. We just do. We just generate some data, just I don't know, just random bytes, uh, and write value to the characteristic. Uh, and we, you know, we have a type with response. With response means that uh, we we want to make sure the data gets written to the uh, device and it didn't get lost because of connectivity or whatever. So this will call uh, peripheral did write value for characteristic. And if it errors out, it will call this, it will also call it, but the error will have the details on why it happened. Uh, there is also another type without response, and this will not call the delegate at all. We just have to trust that there will be worth. Um, subscription is very interesting. So we could tell peripheral to notify changes on the characteristic. 
So two needs to subscribe. If you pass through, it will subscribe. And if you, if you want to stop subscription, you just call it again and pass false over there. This will also this basically tells device to always give up, update us about um, changed value. So in heart rate monitor, it makes sense to subscribe because when you are running your heart rate fluctuates and you want it to uh, always be reported to you. You could read, like make a timer, in a timer instance, and read it every second or whatever, but um, there is no need to that. It's more efficient, better wise to subscribe. And this subscription, like the frequency of uh, how many times it will be called over the time, is totally determined by the device. You don't make this decision. So if it updates its value once in 20 minutes, you will get only one callback of the delegate every 20 minutes rather than every second. So what data can we write or read from those devices? Uh, any binary, we're up to drum roll 30 bytes. So as you can see, it's not a lot of data at all. Uh, you, can, you could technically transfer files, but it will take many, many, many hours, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, there is also a thing that packet data extension, which is also implemented on the uh, Bluetooth stack, on the, hard, on the lower level of the stack, which is not exposed to us. iOS manages it by itself. You could increase packet size to 251 bytes, which is also not a lot. But when you can, when you want to transfer like string messages, it's actually pretty cool. But iOS goes a bit further than that. Uh, if you write Unicode encoded string, so if you make a data object from Unicode, uh, from UTF encoded string, and uh, write to peripheral, it will actually manage many packets uh, for you and transfer it to the uh, peripheral if peripheral does the same, if supports it, basically. Uh, so if you're doing like from iPhone to iPhone or iPhone to some modern device, which is running, for example, uh, like modern stack of the JTT, it will work and it works fine. Uh, if it's really old de device, you'll probably get a couple of strange packets on the other end. So this is like uh, very important. I like this part because on iOS it's implemented really, really nicely and abstraction level we as developers get from the core Bluetooth is like amazing because uh, on Harvey Project uh, we're doing like two applications simultaneously on Android and iOS. And I know my teammate who's working on Android, and we have some Bluetooth connectivity things going on there. And when I see how it works on Android, it's, we appreciate core Bluetooth, basically. It's really well done. Um, so I want to close with like few details uh, on how iOS and DLE work uh, from the iOS perspective. Uh, this is like a rough stack of how it is implemented and how it's, how we as developers see it. So, usually GATT is specific to device. Uh, and that's true actually on Android too, and that's true on almost any other device other than iOS devices. But on iOS, each application gets its GATT stack, which means that you cannot uh, manage or interact with other applications peripherals at all. You have no visibility with it. And iOS itself gets its system GATT, which all is also shielded from you. Uh, what it means that it's kind of good because of the obvious security. You, other Facebook cannot like track my heart rate when it's connected to my application. The when the device is connected to uh, my application. Uh, but it's bad because when you want to do, when you want basically to, for example, in a goodwill, see if there is some, you, or, I don't know, maybe a notification is coming to a phone or a keyboard is doing something which is connected with the Bluetooth, you basically have no visibility to it at all. And those are the, and what, what I'm talking about is are those uh, orangish, um, parts on the system here. So ANCS, AMS, and HOGB. So what are those things? Those are services managed by iOS 
which are pretty cool, but you cannot interact with them from your application. But if you are a hardware designer, or if you are working on the other part, on other iOS application which has to work with other, like this device, it's pretty cool. NCS is a service which provides you with a uh, system notification center. So, for example, if you have, if you are designing a smartwatch, you can pair it, not pair it, but connect it to the iPhone and ask it about the notification and subscribe to the notification, basically. So, when you get a notification on the iPhone, your watch will show it to you. Uh, AMS is equally cool because it gives you access to the now playing view on the lock screen. So, whatever is going on on the now playing view, it will also appear in AMS. And if you are like, if you make like device which one, if you want to display, um, for example, now playing media on your phone, you can ask AMS and it will provide it to you. And this works with any other application. Everything that writes to now playing card works here. HLGP is a very strange thing, but it's also cool because it's an abstraction of HID interface on the over the Bluetooth low image protocol. Basically, if you want to make a, your own Bluetooth keyboard, this is how you hook it up to your eye. Um, there are many standard services uh, defined by GATT, and this is one of the nicest things about Bluetooth rather than Garmin solution, because Garmin doesn't publish its data much and is like very proprietary. And Bluetooth is open, and you can s basically research how standard devices work. So. All of these heart rate uh, services and peripherals, they are just listed on this website and you can read it and use it in your application. Basically, if something has a Bluetooth low energy, you could cut it from your application. If it's made by other company, you still can connect it and explore it and interact with it. If it uses standard services, it's easy because it's documented. If it's not, you still can interrogate it and like reverse engineer this. Um, yeah, those are like examples of standard services. So battery service, if something has a battery and has Bluetooth low energy, it probably has a battery service and can like report you how much battery it has left. Uh, heart rate service, the example is discussed. Crime speed and cadence, environmental service, so it's weather station can report about temperature, wind speed, and so on. So. Yeah, this is the part I mentioned. So it's very high level. It's totally open. You can connect to everything, or ask for any service, ask for any characteristic, look into the values, maybe even break it by writing some strange values, whatever. Uh, Light Blue app is an application on App Store. It's basically uh, an, in, an application that has no services defined, so it's always asking for all services it sees on the network, on the Bluetooth. So, this is a good tool to explore other devices with. I think that's it. Thank you very much. If you have questions, go for it. Yes? I have questions related to you, you, I, you covered in your presentation, but I wanted to make sure I understood. So you can basically specify any string as a UUID. It doesn't have to be like the, there is like the, a standard UUID that is used in other contexts that have a specific number of bytes, maybe 16 or something. But this is just like you can have a string of any length, or is there a maximum length? Or yeah, then there is. I haven't tried to abuse it, but uh, recommendation is used to 64 bit UUID. But you can use anything. Okay. It can't be longer, or is there a maximum? It can be longer. Okay. Be I guess there is a limit, but again, I haven't tried to abuse it. Usually, it's safe to to go with 64 because it's very hard to uh, match with something other than this. So when you are designing your own service or characteristic, it's just safe because the chances of other services having the same UID is very low. Right. And the the ones the shorter ones are used because they are defined in this standard, basically, and they trust you not to have the same one. You could define it the same one, but it would probably break. That, that was one of my other questions. And then use, you can set it yourself. 
So actually, if somebody was malicious, they could imitate your device very easily by just saying, just finding out where you do ideas and setting that as their own. So like, as an application developer, I might not want to actually trust that any device that I know the UU ID of is actually that device and not something imitating being that device. Is that correct? Yes, okay. so you can add some checks, like your logical checks, sure. but uh, the API, like JTT API, is designed so far it's completely hackable, yeah. Right. In a good and bad way right. as well. Well, I just need you know, be careful and don't, don't make naive assumptions about what the yeah. other thing is, device is doing, you're working with. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like though the data is going to be coming in in a certain format, so the hackability, yeah, it could be hacked, but perhaps not very effectively, right? If it's my heartbeat and someone hacks the heartbeat into it, well, there will be bad data, but it's not like they're going to get into my system and get my personal information out of the device. The data, my program will behave a certain way. If I allow SQL injection and they have a way of getting it in, yeah, maybe that could happen. But most applications are going to be very specific to the data coming from the device. Yeah, the, uh, the data, you, you're right. Data is totally, um, you can write any, basically, uh, sequence of zeros at once. You can encrypt the data if you want to. You could leave it as is. In heart rate, example, it's just an, inter just an integer, 8-bit uh, integer, integer, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's up to you what you write, though. So you could have security to our security, I guess. Right. But, uh, or you can build a security layer on top of it, of course. Yeah. Yes. But the tree of right. services and uh, uh, of characteristics is totally open. Yeah, everybody can see it. Organization, umbrella organization which manages the whole standard. They don't do engineering at all, okay. uh, but they define the, how API should be behave, and the list of these specifications, like, uh, sorry, services and characteristics, also on the Bluetooth. So they trust you to not collide with those, but everything that is not defined is open to anybody. And I guess that's why they recommend such long UIDs, like 64 bit ones. And I guess 128 are also totally fine. Uh, so there is no, there is very low chance of collision. Uh, and those ones are really short, like super short ones. Like for example, where is it? We can see the service has like 180D, like four, four times eight, so that's like 32. And heart rate measurement is equally short one. So. But those on the short because again they are on the document. That's it. One other quick question. If you run into any weird bugs or stability issues or inconsistencies between like various iOS releases. Yeah, that's the good part on the iOS. It's totally abstracted from you. So it's been pretty stable. It's from I iPhone OS 2.0, this works. Oh cool. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool, yeah. On Android, it's Pretty, it's very different. You have to manage some hardware parts like change voltages and stuff, antenna things, and even such things. When, you, for example, if you send a really long string, uh, which is obviously bigger than 30 bytes, iOS basically does everything for you. It will have manage the hardware, prepare the hardware, send it, confirm it, and everything is done for you. On Android, on some of the older versions, now it's getting better, but. Uh, 
you have to basically boost the antenna to prepare to send a big pipe, you know, a big packet, and then lower, and don't forget to lower it so it doesn't go very bad. Is it possible to get that level of like? Uh, of not in uh, LE SDK. Okay. And I'm not sure. I haven't. I don't have much experience with the classic Bluetooth. Okay. Uh, but there are some hooks you can use if, when you are using classic Bluetooth. But I'm not sure about that. Maybe time for one more question. Okay. Four. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you very much. Yeah.